My, my work has gravitated towards the management of type 1 diabetes, and as I'll talk about, this is a very complicated disease for patients to manage, and so our job is to, is to make this a, um, a, a disease, disease that they can live with, and we have many patients who've now lived for 50 or 60 years, but it's a lot of work, and so there are clearly, uh, there's clearly a need for a cure for this disease. And so I'm gonna come over here so I can see which slides are coming up. So this is, um, this is a disorder now that, um, is also increasing as is type two, not quite at the same rate, and it's only about um, four to five percent of patients with diabetes have the type one kind, and type one diabetes is a disorder of predominantly of childhood, and the about forty-five percent of, of people who end up getting uh, type one diabetes get it before the age of ten. Um, it is an autoimmune disease whereby the immune system, which is supposed to protect us against foreign things like bacteria and viruses, the immune system turns on itself and attacks and destroys the cells in the pancreas that make insulin. They're called the beta cells. There are a lot of auto, other autoimmune diseases you've probably heard of, like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, and those kinds of disorders. And because it knocks out the, uh, the pancreas' insulin production, uh, patients need to take insulin for life to stay alive. And before 1922, when insulin was discovered, uh, people uniformly died of this condition. So insulin is something you've heard about from other speakers today. It's a hormone, and a hormone is something that's made in one place and has actions elsewhere. So insulin is made in the pancreas, and it goes into the bloodstream, and it goes to tissues, especially muscle and fat tissues, and it allows sugar to enter into the cell where it's burned as energy. And the, the sugar I'm going to be talking about is predominantly glucose, a term you may already be familiar with. So. Uh, diabetes can be a really bad disease. It damages the little blood vessels in the eyes, the kidneys, and the nerves, um, and it damages those organs. It also affects large blood vessels leading to the brain and to the heart, um, and so it can contribute to heart attack and strokes as well. And so diabetes now, type 2 and type 1, because it's, um, they both are diseases of high blood sugar, um, are the leading cause of adult blindness in the United States, leading cause of end-stage uh, kidney disease, and the leading cause of non-traumatic amputations in the United States. And if you have diabetes, you have a two- to four-fold increased risk of having a heart attack or stroke. So our job is try to keep the glucose levels as close to normal as possible uh, to prevent complications, because it's been shown that tight blood sugar control will prevent complications. And so this is a challenge. So we have to teach patients how to replace insulin the way that the body does, and that's a challenge. It's, we, don't, we don't respect what our body does for us until that organ breaks down and it stops doing what it does. So um, we have to teach patients how to um, dose their insulin based on um, their, uh, the foods that they eat. We have to teach them how to give insulin injections or use an insulin pump and we have them test their glucose levels by a finger stick, uh, blood sugar level, um, before meals in the bedtime, anytime they feel high or low, before exercise, before driving. So they do a lot of blood sugar testing during the day as well. And they, they can also adjust their insulin dose based on the blood sugar level so that they can bring it down with extra insulin. So this is a challenge because uh, we teach patients how to adjust their insulin based on the carbohydrate content of the food and if you looked at your sandwich, um, you know, a patient with type 1 diabetes has to figure out how much in that wrap, how many carbs are in that wrap, how much sugar is in the sauces that it's in that. They can look at a bag because the carbohydrates are labeled in the bag, but um, think about eating a slice of pizza. You know, how thick is the crust, how much sugar is in the pizza sauce, how much sugar is in the cheese that's in there. It's a challenge. Um, we ask patients, because insulins these days don't work immediately, we ask them to dose the insulin 15 to 20 minutes before the meal because that's how long it takes the insulin to get in the bloodstream. And if you think about having lunch on the run, it's hard to wait 15 or 20 minutes. So that's a challenge. Um, they have to incorporate, well, have I been physically active? Because then I have to take less insulin. Am I stressed? Have I been really inactive? Because then I probably need more insulin. And be, based on where they inject, how deep they inject, how warm the skin is there, whether they have any scar tissue in that area, it affects insulin absorption. So this is a real challenge for patients to have to overcome all these uh, different features. And so uh, the other drawback is, is that the drug that we're, try we're using, insulin, to bring glucose levels in a normal range uh, can also cause a low blood sugar reaction. So the narrow range is very tight, and you go a little bit below the normal range, and you can have significant symptoms from a low blood sugar. Um, and serious low blood sugars are called severe hypoglycemia. 
is defined as uh, needing insulin uh, or needing help from somebody else to, to treat a low blood sugar reaction. It occurs in about a quarter of patients per year. The symptoms can take you know, up to hours before they fully resolve. It can cause seizures, and we think that four to six percent of patients with type one diabetes will ultimately die of a low blood sugar reaction. So our treatment is, is effective, but it also potentially can lead to severe outcomes. So um, if you think about all the things I talked about, Patients with type 1 diabetes really think about their diabetes all the time because everything they, they do during the day affects their diabetes. So this is doing a finger stick. They do this four to six times a day on average. These are injections that they have to give themselves with needles and pens, syringes. Um, patients can now wear insulin pumps that deliver short-acting insulin throughout the day and they can tell the pump how much insulin um, they want to have delivered. But this is what most patients feel. They feel they are diabetic. They're different from everybody else. They have to give themselves injections all day. And so they really feel like pin cushions a lot of times. And so what we do research-wise gives them hope because what they really want is a, a cure for this disease. So that's why a lot of people are working very hard to, to find a cure. So um, I'm involved in a number of things that are ultimately um, hopefully will lead to a cure. And the one thing I wanted to talk about because the um, immunology lab I'm working with is doing some exciting things is, is immunotherapy. So this is an immune disorder, an autoimmune disorder. So the immune system goes awry. So if we can some way block the immune system from attacking and destroying those cells, patients may not develop type 1 diabetes and then don't need to treat themselves with insulin. So this can be done in two ways. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but we can either block the cells that are doing the attacking, or there are also some protective cells called regulatory cells that I'm talking more about. If we can support them, um, then we might be able to also prevent the disease from occurring. So this is, a, um, this is a diagram of those two cell types. And so these T effector cells are the ones, ordinarily their job is to uh, treat foreign, uh, or attack foreign things such as viruses and bacteria um, and rid them of, of out of the body. And they also scan cells that have changed within the body, like early tumor cells, cancer cells, and they attack and destroy those as well. What, um, but they're clearly not meant to attack self tissues, uh, otherwise we wouldn't be alive. And so these regulatory cells here prevent the immune system from attacking and destroying self tissues. So what happens in type 1 diabetes is these cells fail both in number and in function to block the uh, T effector, the bad attacking cells, from, uh, for some reason, um, there's a trigger that causes the immune system to attack and destroy insulin-producing beta cells. And so a number of studies, some of which I've been involved with, have been geared towards preventing those attacking cells from doing the attacking of, of beta cells. And so what mostly we've done is in patients who have new onset type 1 diabetes, they still have about 20% of their insulin producing cells. And if you can get them rapidly treated and get them regulated in terms of how much sugar and starch they're eating in their diet, a lot of times they can actually be protected from needing insulin. So if you can preserve those last 20%, you're doing, you've, you've done them a huge service. And even if they need a little bit of insulin, it may, remains remarkably easy to control if, ever, if the pancreas is still able to, to kick in and produce some insulin um, during the day to help smooth out glucose levels. So these are a number of drugs that have been used. I was involved in the design and study of otolexizumab, um, a, a, an antibody that targeted those cells that were doing the attacking. And Invariably, when we do a lot of studies on, on rodent animals, things work beautifully. And so when a lot of these drugs were used in mouse models called the um, NOD, or non-obese diabetic mouse that develops type 1 diabetes, they worked very effectively. But what we found is, is the, immune, the human immune system is much more complicated, and oftentimes these uh, types of therapies aren't as effective in humans. And at higher dosages that lead to good protection against the progression of type 1 diabetes, that there tends to be side effects from these medications, such as fever, headache, a drop in blood pressure, rashes. And you can get reactivation um, of viruses, like Epstein-Barr viruses, that causes mononucleosis. And the problem with, we don't know also the long-term immunosuppressive effects. Well, actually, we do know from experience in using immunosuppressive drugs for transplant patients that they are at increased risk for infections and ultimately for some cancers as well. 
So we have a disease that we can manage with insulin, so we have to first do no harm. And so these kinds of long-term risks are a problem because we don't want our patients getting infections. We also don't want them getting cancers. So our lab, um, uh, in combination with Dr. Uh, Abdel Hamad, um, one of our immunologists, um, have been looking at the regulatory cells as supporting the regulatory cells because if we can keep them functioning and do their job of, of preventing the um, effector T cells, the bad attacking cells from, from turning on and, and attacking uh, insulin producing cells, then um, that's an avenue of, of treatment potentially. So these uh, regulatory cells have been studied and it finds that their number and their function drops off in people when they develop type 1 diabetes. And uh, we have been um, one of the labs that have concluded that these cells die by something called the phos ligand pathway. Phos and phos ligand are on the surface of immune cells and when two cells get together to possess these, it causes the cells to die. And why would they have this? Well, think about the immune system when it fights a virus or a bacteria. The immune system revs up to fight and attack it, and then you need something that, that kills those cells and, and brings them back um, to more normal numbers. And so that's the fast phos ligand. That's the good way it works. But in, um, that is activated in persons with um, uh, new onset type 1. In the regulatory cells, it's activated, and so the cell numbers drop off and their function drops off. Um, so, um, we have uh, found a way to block this. So an antibody has been created that targets this phos ligand. So if you target that, it, so an antibody binds to the phos ligand. This is a surface protein on the immune cells. And by, by attaching to it, it prevents from binding with, with phos and it prevents those cells from dying off. And at dosages um, that have been used at very low dosage, you're not suppressing the normal regulatory you know, function of, of the immune system to downregulate in times of infection. And when this phos ligand is given to the NOD mouse, it prevents it from developing type 1 diabetes. And that's exciting because what we're doing here is not causing immune suppression. We're, we're supporting the regulatory cells in the body that, uh, that, that um, prevent autoimmunity from happening. So what we're currently doing is we're making um, what's called a humanized antibody. So if we, we can make antibodies in animals very, very well, but if you, if you make an animal antibody, then that's a foreign substance to a human, and the human automatically attacks and destroys that. So we're making a humanized antibody that, that attaches on to this phos ligand, phos ligand um, surface protein. And we are then going to be testing them in human cells to see their effects on normal human cells and, uh, and seeing how immunity changes in, in persons without diabetes, and then our ultimate goal is to, to test these in patients with type 1 diabetes, early onset type 1 diabetes, and see if we can arrest the, the destruction of the insulin-producing beta cells. So, yeah, so now we'd be only targeting a very small portion of the population, those people who have new onset type 1. Well, how about if we um, how would we know whether or not somebody's going to develop type 1, and could we use this even before they've lost their 80% of insulin-producing cells? So there are ways, through screening of, of people who have relatives with type 1 diabetes, that we can see if, they're gonna be, if they have positive antibodies. There are antibody markers in autoimmune diseases that we can test in the blood, and if they're present, especially in increased numbers, we know what we can predict what rate they'll develop type 1 diabetes and uh, in those who are at high risk for developing type 1 diabetes in the next five years, it's a natural target uh, for giving this antibody to, as long as it's shown to be safe and effective. So that's, uh, that's my part. Thank you.